All right, good evening and welcome back to the shop. This beautiful spring, well, almost spring, evening here in New England. I hope you're enjoying your setup wherever you are, but just imagine that you're taking a seat here in the shop. We've opened the doors for you to come on in. And tonight I'm excited because I'm going to actually finish a project that I have had off to the side for 12 years. That's right, 12 years. Not a month, not a few months, not a few weeks, 12 whole years. Can anyone beat me on that? Go ahead and chat in if you've got some projects hanging around longer than that. I probably could find actually more projects upstairs that were started and uh, someday they'll be done. But um, I'm excited to finish this project, but before we get into that, I just want to remind you that we're really helped by you subscribing and ringing that bell. So if you like this content, why not go ahead, subscribe, and be part of us a little more. It's really, it's really hardly any commitment at all because <laughs> you, <don't, laughs> you, you don't get bugged or anything like that if you just want to follow us along. If you want to be a closer follower, you can go to our website at epicwoodworking.com and get on the mailing list. And from time to time, we'll let you know what's going on. Um, some people have received discounts when we have a new course um, on plans and whatnot. So the only way you see some of that stuff is by being on our mailing list. So you can do that at epicwoodworking.com. All right, so let's get started. I know I have drifted in and out with this chest of drawers over the last, what, six months. Uh, we've done a few things here and there on it. We did uh, put new, um, well, I'll show you when we get to it. On the, on the drawer sides, we, we made a better draw, drawer side, draw side. That's, that's Lowell, that's how you say it in Lowell, draw, <laughs> right? And uh, anyway, we, um, we've talked about the finish, and tonight we're going to bring it on home. And, you know, to finish anything like this, it's crazy how many details there are. And if there's one thing I've learned in woodworking, but never really learn it, is that everything takes longer than you think. <laughs> because it's fine work, you know, and... Whenever I was pressing to deliver a piece, there's something about all those little things you have to do at the end that really make it special, that set it apart and raise the bar a little bit and show that you cared, right? Those little things, you kind of want to just get it over with. But just pushing through and getting those done takes a lot of time. And so I'm always shocked how I'm running around like a squirrel at the end of a project. And I know I'm not alone in this. I've, I have, like my friend David Lamb, I've gone over there when he was near the end of a project and helped him load it up or something. And it's amusing because I'd go in his shop and look in his shop and it, I actually, this is pretty clean right now, but I had, you'd see paper towels and <laughs> steel wool and just, trash all over the place. It's like you're doing everything crazy to try to get that thing done, loaded up and delivered to the client. And I don't know, it's always like that. So tonight I got ready and I only have a few aspects of this. I don't have all the parts of it, but I do want to show you some of the things that you can do and it apply to, uh, some of these things will apply to a lot of different projects. But in particular, we're talking about a chest of drawers, a traditional walnut chest of drawers. And I've got it on its side right here. And some of the things we're doing will apply also to the fine woodworking video series they've got going right now on the shaker, they're calling it the shaker dresser, but it's a shaker chest of drawers. And I wrote down, I forget how many, I put it in the Instagram text, but there's like a hundred, do you have that? 
133, 118 joints or something. In 118 joints. dovetails, dovetails. Right. on this chest, and there's 130 something 133, I think. parts, 133 parts, and all of those were shaped, and, and it gets, that adds up, you know, and that's why chests of drawers are not inexpensive. When you tackle and build one, you've built something really admirable because it's not easy to get it done. It's, there's a lot to it, and there's the moving parts with the, with the drawers, but you really have something. It's like the anchor of the bedroom, right? Or it's like this really impressive, noble piece that's off to the side of a, of a dining area. You could even have it in a living room space on a wall. It's, there's something about it that's really special. And you can tell that there's a lot of time in it. If you look on websites like Thomas Moser Furniture, like it's T-O-S, T-H-O-S, Moser <coughs> Furniture. And a chest of drawers like this one, actually a shaker one that's a, a five drawer chest, you have to pay, it's about eight, in Walnut, it's eight or $9,000 for a five drawer chest of drawers without the amount of detail this has. And that's simply because of the amount of work it is to get it right and to get it done well. So. I'm filming it like they haven't ever seen it before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably a lot of people haven't. <laughs> but now it's on its side, so I'm trying to it's trick a you like. View. This is something new. All right, so I already rubbed out all of the chest uh, except for this side. And I just want to quickly show you one more time. I got plenty of shellac on this and I'm gonna first just hit it quickly with 320. Now this serves two purposes. It knocks off the dust nibs from the shellac but also when you put on that last coat of shellac, I go closer to a two pound cut. You actually, it's pretty smooth but there's a little graininess to it on the top. You don't want orange peel, that looks thick but that graininess you're actually leveling a little bit if you use the, the sandpaper. This is 320 and it's kind of beat down. I'm just going to quickly, with a felt block, sand this. And look how beautifully that's powdering up. And I can feel it feels silkier already. But it's amazing. This, there's plenty of shellac on there. I'm not taking it off here. Down here, you tend to get a little more. I don't know, can you come on in here and yeah, see this? Yeah, I'm gonna come closer. Like, down in this bottom area, when you're spraying the side and then you come this way, you end up getting a little more finish in certain places. And wherever you have that on a project, you wanna first sand it with your 320, because if you look, I don't know if you can see it in the light. It looks a little dottier and spottier right there. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, um, that's where it's a little grainier. It's, it's not orange peel, but by hitting it with the sandpaper first, you're leveling it and the uh, steel wool is going to do a much nicer job much faster. Okay, so we'll hit that. Then I'm gonna take the paper out. We're going to hit that. Did anyone say they have some old projects? Oh, there's quite the range. Anybody admitting it? Yeah, they are. They're even admitting it for their spouses at it's, times. It's good for your soul, folks. <laughs> but you know, um, there's nothing like telling a bunch of people you're going to finish it yeah. to get it done. Tom, would you finish a lacquer finish in the same way? Um, Evan's asking. Evan, yeah. Uh, you can. You certainly can. Um, it depends what kind of sheen you're going for, but yes, we actually, lacquer's gonna build up nicely too. I'm talking standard lacquer, not like a conversion varnish or anything like that. But yeah, you, you give it the light sanding and then the steel wool to get a, a kind of like a, a soft gloss. It's, it's, I almost wanna call it semi-gloss, but which it kind of is, but it's like... Semi-satin, you said. <laughs> yeah, it has this beautiful sheen, and you're going to see it right now. All right, so now I've done that. Now, I've got a... What I like to do 
is, let's do the feet first, and then we'll do the sides here. I'm going to take a fresh piece of steel wool. I've got kind of a ball here. I'm going to come in and get the molding down here. Really bear down. The, the neat thing about the steel wool, I mean the uh, shellac, is that it's tough. You're not going to rub through it if you got enough on there. <laughs> and I know I do. I threw on an extra coat because uh, it felt still a little bit thin. And Is the inside of the foot finished, Tom? In here? Yeah, I sprayed a little bit of finish on there, up under there to darken it up. But I will uh, dust that off and I'll Not show you. Not the underside, you. though. The underside I did hit with one coat of shellac down here. I'm going to talk about the base in a second. Uh, next. I Once. was talking under, underneath the foot is what I was trying to see. Underneath the foot. What like do you mean? The, on the very bottom? Inside of the foot. In here. Yes. I hit it with one okay. sealer coat of clear shellac. Um, How many coats do you know? I've got three to four coats of shellac and I and I go with um, I guess this has four because I was going with a pound and a half cut all the way and uh, but if you put that last coat on like a little heavier like a good two pound cut you will you can get by with three um, depends you want to just feel that it's not too thick but I use some of that if you saw the shellac seminar we did um, the webinar with fine woodworking I used that same, uh, the stuff that I mixed up on there because it was wax free and, and then um, it had a nice color to it. It was like some beautiful orange shellac and I put some of that on here and then went with clear over the top. Alright, so you see what I did here? To get in here, I'm sanding like cross, I'm, I'm, I'm steel wooling cross grain but don't worry that's really the only way you can get right down in that crevice and uh, you want to really burnish it until you see all the little sparkliness of the shellac disappear so it looks really dull and, and don't worry it's gonna come back to beautiful life in a minute but once I've gone across there now I wrap some steel wool around my felt block I just unrolled a regular thing and I'm going to now use it and get in here and now I'm changing the the rub pattern of that right down at the foot so it won't look cross grain. I have a question about the felt um, block Tom is that like an eraser felt eraser is it similar to that? Or? It's similar to the density but there's no like cuts in it it's very firm but it has a squish factor and that's what you like for rubbing out because it kind of conforms with whatever subtle undulations you might have in the piece. So if you had any kind of, it just, it just melds right to the little subtleness of the surface. And it works beautifully for rubbing out finishes. Um, um, I have a question also, is that stained or a natural wood color? This is natural. This has just um, shellac. So I used some amber shellac on it till it looked about right. And then I switched over to clear. The top coats were clear zinzer. Um, Did you say you sprayed or do you <coughs> not, did not spray it? I sprayed. I sprayed this. And I talked some about that um, on that shellac webinar. And the steel wool, where do you get that? Is it special kind or is it? No, this is actually, you can get it at any kind of hardware store, or box store. Um, this is four rot steel wool. It's the, so four zeros. It's the finest typically that they sell. And uh, you can, you get it in these packs like this. And then you can unroll it to do this. Now, you can find sources that sell really nice um, steel wool. The brand is that I used to get and is still available, I know, is uh, Liberon. And they'll sell it to you in rolls, like big rolls where it's really flat so it's not balled up. But by rolling it out like this on the felt block, 
you've created a nice flat pad to get a really nice even sheen. All right, that's looking pretty sweet. Um, I'm trying to kill all the sparkly shininess of it <laughs> that looks chintzy. It seems so odd that that will do it. Oh, There's yeah. There's a question about where you get the felt blocks. I know we were trying to figure that out at one, one other Yeah, somebody night. tell me. I, I should have thought about that. It would come up again. I, I've had mine so long that I forget, but I'm sure that... Um, can you use uh, wax or oh. and unwax on the same project? Uh, yes, you can. Um, they're compatible, but it's just, it depends if you're going to top coat with something else. Now, the reason I went with the, the unwax is because um, on the top, I top coated that with a more durable finish. Um, I used some tungo varnish, some water locks, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. And that, so the coats right under that are wax free. So that there's a good compatibility factor and everything will be hunky dory. All right, now let's get a close look at this. Okay, you see, you can see the powder, the whiter lines in there, but it feels great. I mean, it just feels nice and smooth. And now I'm going to wax it. So I'm going to bring in my Goddard's Cabinet Maker's Wax. This is a, just a lemon oil and beeswax. It's nice. And there's others that work fine too. You could use a paste wax here like Brie Wax. But it's always tougher uh, to not have it streak. I just want to get a little bit right here. We can link to that stuff too. Yeah. Um. So here we go. I'm going to spray this on. Ready? Just a nice little, now watch how it changes. <laughs> it's going to come back to life. The wax gets right in there. And got my nice clean rag. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. <laughs> and then, can you see this good? Yeah, it's gorgeous. See the color? How much would I you say, Ron is asking, how much would you say the color has changed in 12 years? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's a good that question. That was the whole I, reason you waited, right? Exactly. It's like a fine wine. <laughs> uh, it's a 12-year blend. Yeah. Uh, but it hasn't changed a whole lot because I had it covered most of the time down in the finishing room. Um, but the back panel has changed, and I'll show you that when we get there. But check that out. Is that it's not beautiful? Beautiful. You see it now? Yeah, it's so nice. Wow. The color is rich, and that has such a beautiful feel. It's, it's turned like really elegant and first class finish without being overly stuffy and shiny formal. It has a really nice warm glow. Now, I'm going to put this up on the bench so we can. That side panel, Tom, <laughs> is it book matched or was it resawn? Yes, that is a book match. Uh, it's not. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me get it back here so you can see it. Okay. Yeah, this side panel actually, yeah, it was consecutive boards. I got these boards from Pug Moore, and he had them in his attic. And they were sequentially sawn. There was like four of them that were beautiful wide. And so I took two of them and then book matched after they were playing. So you can see that pattern. Are you picking that up? Uh, it was a little dark. Now I can. Okay, good. You can see how that pattern is mirrored on each side. Usually you only see that with veneer. But in this case, I had the solid wood. So it was fun to get a nice match like that. All right, so now let's look into the back of the cabinet here. Don't be distracted by the mess behind there. <laughs> I think by now, if they watch us much, they're probably beyond being distracted by anything. Okay. <laughs> Just the I, way it is. So, oh, I meant to say something about the bottom while we we're there. But uh, all, I, all I'm going to say, look, you can see it from here. <laughs> the bottom 
is this is the way this chest was constructed is you have a box you have your side here and then the bottom coming across here just like this top piece okay so it was all dovetailed just like this top see this these dovetails and this is some old yellow pine from down south that came out of a a uh, their resawn floor joists from a uh, tobacco warehouse yeah tobacco warehouse that's right in Wilson North Carolina <laughs> so uh, but anyway this is the frame this base frame is actually the molding so you can see this side molding it sits underneath and that's it right there and it goes out so the box sits on top of a molding frame so it's like a box on on a frame so or a case is the more technical word for the the box shape here now a lot of chests that we made were not made this way the chest itself would go all the way down and the molding was applied to the side of the chest it wouldn't be underneath like this so this case side if you imagine this is just gone you know and this the case is sitting right on the back foot and then the molding here oh I forgot to add these dovetails so that would be 124 <laughs> there's six here um, but anyway that's the the base frame there now once you got it all open like this in the back this is when I sprayed it like these come out still these aren't these are dry fit I don't ever glue them in because if you want to put in a dust petition you've got it right there and um, this one I don't have the dust petitions for but I could and they're nice I mean they make a cleaner look the shaker chest of drawers that's what we did and uh, so we've we've got um, so you'll see that the dust petitions there can you see okay okay so they um, and the nice reason to put dust petitions in too it's like a panel separating the drawer sections is so that if you put drawer locks on you can prevent you know somebody from going into another drawer easily but with it open I like take these out and I spray the whole back inside from here then it's all shellacky you know I just put really one good coat in there of one pound and a half and then I'll come in and I'll sand everything so it powders up and it gets real silky and then I'll come in with the with the uh, paste wax and you can you want to wax all these openings here see so get a good swab of it and that's nice I'll get this side here right on the runners see that and then on the drawer sides of each That was the main one. I didn't do that one there. Okay, so with the shellac and the wax, it makes an incredibly slick surface for the drawers to slide on. Now this is glued in in the front, but we get this divider in the back, comes in, and I've slotted the screw that mounts into here so that this can move a little bit. The, this rail can slide forward and back if it needs to with the drawer with the case sides expanding and contracting this is not going to move it's the grain is running crossways and it's going to be pretty fixed in space so that's slotted and I'm going to put a little screw right up in there and it's going to allow that to move nice picture of your head there sorry I should think more of where you are. <laughs> you All right. really well with that. So then we're going to go up and just snug that up. Okay. But you know what? I didn't want to put that in yet. I forgot about something. I forgot I wanted to put the top on. But that was easy. We didn't really. I'll, I'll come back to that. 
All right, so now I want to put the top on, but let's, let me show you what the top looks like over here. Brian, while Tom's doing that, you asked how many coats of shellac, and he, he said a little earlier three, he thinks maybe four. Um, Tom? Yeah, usually a minimum of, of three, but you don't want a huge buildup. I'm spraying like thin pound and a half co co cuts, so that's what I've got there. All right, so check this out. Here's, this is unusual again. Like this molding is usually wrapped around the case itself but this is another way of doing it where similar to the base frame where the case is sitting on the molding frame at the bottom the molding frame for the cove at the top is actually going to sit on top of the case which is nice in one way but then it makes a little more complication in attaching so you see I had to attach that to the top now the top underneath here will be expanding and contracting. This will not because the rail is running cross grain along the length here. It, it doesn't move at all. It stays stable here. However, this will be contracting and expanding like an accordion across the wood grain. So I had to put a slotted screw in there. <coughs> and you can see that right here. Let me just pull this one out so you can see. So you can see that there's a little slot there and this screw is buried so that the head is not in the way and the top can expand and contract. Like right now it's winter so it's, it's uh, you just want to snug that so it can move a little bit. And I won't get any cracking on the top because this is not glued down. If that was glued down across grain like that, you would see a crack exposed here because it couldn't move at all. So that's all attached nicely, and look at that. This is the whole thing. It's got the cove molding attached, and this is a classic Chippendale type top where you have this bead, and then this little cut, inside cut, which is called a fillet, and then the cove below. That's a nice healthy molding there. Now this just gets attached to the top. Uh, let me turn the, this case here. So pretty. Back over, back over here. Okay, so this is going to go on. And I've got about an eighth inch overhang here. I'm just going to feel it. I can look at it, but I can tell it's pretty close. balance it side to side. I, now I pre-drilled some holes in the front. These holes are not going to move at all. And, but in the back I left a little bit of a slotted hole back there. So let me Gee, just get this. Tony's asking if you used a slot cutting router bit for the screw slot. I didn't for that. No, I used a, uh, Tony, I, rather than set that all up, I just used a forcing a bit on the drill press and set it to like an eighth inch deep. And then I went through with a, um, a regular drill bit in the center. And uh, if they didn't, I made a couple holes. And if it didn't break together, I would just chisel it out and make it so it was a slot. Yeah, sometimes you want to route that, but when I only have a few to do like this, it's not worth that whole setup just faster with the force there. All right, so I'm going to hold this in place while we're, while I get the screws in. So to put the top on, I'm just using some one and a quarter inch coarse thread countersunk screws, also known as coarse thread drywall screws, <laughs> which they're actually good for this. So they're going to go in and I countersunk so they're buried. And let's just get these across the front. Get this one over here. 
This is going on and it's staying on. We've been getting a lot of questions about projects and stuff coming up and plans and via email and whatnot. Yeah, we got some great ones. We're going to, we'll be doing the uh, candle stand project next and we'll be announcing that next week. So be present. Uh, yeah. That'll be fun for, it'll be a nice class. And I've got a couple others planned uh, following that. I'm going to ask you a couple questions while you're doing that, okay? Sure. Uh, do you rub, would you rub it down the same way you used, uh, if you used water locks? When you, that same kind of finish technique, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mike's asking. Yeah, Mike, you can do that if you want that look. I'm going to show you on the top of this, though. I've got a different, I've got water locks. But you don't always have to rub it out like that. And I'm going to show you another sheen on this one. So I'm just getting the last screws in here. Uh, Tom, Joe's asking if you've used Balin's uh, wood lube with the steel wool. Yes, I have. I've used actually Mohawks, um, which works nice. But you can, for this, I don't like using it because I can, because I want to see when I've removed the sparkliness of the shellac and when it's wet like that. You have to get it dry before you can actually see <coughs> what you hit and what you didn't. And it's easier to do it dry and then. Put your wax on for shellac like this. <clears throat> but okay, that's that. Now I'm going to put the back, this back on. I needed this off for access to screw the top on. I'll come back there. I'll swing it around for you. So if this had dust petitions, I would have slid that in first. And uh, Let's see, where's my, oh, here it is. Okay. Do you create your own profile cutters for molding, Tom? Um, no, I, well, once in a while I had to, but. What are you doing? I can't blink. Sorry. <laughs> it's a mystery. Um, Just got to see yeah. this. I'm Excited. just snugging that up, okay? So now that can move. <laughs> That's good to go. All right. So let's go ahead and get the back on, and then we can set this down on the floor. Um, hope I can lift it. Maybe I should put it on the floor now. Sorry, did I interrupt your question? You're answering the question about profile cutters. Oh, yeah. Um, Sometimes I'll, I use actually more, more than often than not, I'll use different areas of different cutters that I already have. So I have like a, a five eighths, a half inch cove cutter. Um, so I forget what I use for this one. And then various bead cutters and coves. And, you know, you use different partial, uh, partial um, sections of the router bit to create a lot of different cutters. But this is not a special cutter. This is just a cove. And then I may have ended up taking just a block plane to nose that bead off. Um, unless you have a little, you know, because this is a subtle little cut and it doesn't take long to make that bead by hand once you've run the cove. But it depends on the situation. If you're trying to match an exact historical piece, then sometimes, yeah, you have to, you do have to get one made. All right, let's see. I'm going to sit this down carefully. <laughs> it's amazing how heavy a solid wood chest can get. But uh, now we've got it off of the stand here. Let's just get that a beauty. All right, so let's get the back on. 
check this out. This is a frame and panel back. This has really gone the extra mile. Look at that. This is all uh, mortise and tenon here and into here. And then these panels are floating in that space. So you can kind of see the, the scalloping from the hand planing. This entire surface didn't get sandpaper. It was just all hand planed to a finish. I like doing the surfaces like that. And this is poplar, and it doesn't usually look like this. It's uh, greener when it's fresh. Let me show you. Um, you mean like 12 years ago? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'll show you on the, on the drawer bottoms when I get to them. But this had a greener cast, but now it has, look, has this beautiful aged look. Look at that. You, you pay extra for that. <laughs> All right, so the other side has the flat panel, and you can choose whether to put this out or in. And I've, I have put that side out, but I think for this side, I think the raised looks I better. I like the raised. Seems yeah. it's going to be mine. Oh, it is? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Isn't that what you told me? <laughs> yeah, I was going to announce that at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I've already announced it on the chat. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> okay. They, I, Dean asked about it. So it is. It's the camera lady's chest. She's gonna have her own special chest of drawers. What do you think about figure eights, Tom? Oh, <laughs> watch out, folks! Here it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> when you can execute a figure eight, it's amazing. It's like <laughs> I, I can't really do one. I'm, I'm a hockey player <laughs> myself. Uh. No, uh, Set you right up for that. Those figure eight attachment, I believe you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Ways of attaching tops. I haven't used those. I'm, I'm usually using, trying not to use metal because a lot of the things you're doing are more period. So um, I'm not opposed to them. I just haven't used them much. That's, they're pretty clever way of attaching tops. But... Let me show you for the back here, I'm going to use these number six inch and a quarter countersunk brass. And I've already pre drilled everything. So I'm going to throw those in. And these just go into the frame here. And isn't that pretty back? It's almost too nice to put against did the wall. Did you use shellac on the, on the back too? I did hit it with a coat of shellac. The same as the inside. So it's got like one coat you know, pound and a half. So, and then I knocked it down with quickly with, with uh, sandpaper. And I could wipe it off, wipe it down with a, a waxy rag and that white will go away. So, yeah, this is pretty sweet. Now for the chest of drawers, the, um, um, the shaker dresser that's with the fine woodworking program, that back does not have this elaborate of a setup. I was going to do it, but an article like that takes a lot of pages just to do the chest. So the back we went more straightforward with shiplap. So we have a six board shiplap back on that one that you'll see. And that's a really nice, it's a really nice option too. You know, this is, this is almost too nice for the back of a case, you know? But these are countersinking very sweetly. And the brass blends in. The brass blends in really good. <laughs> no, Ron, this project was not for the camera lady 12 years ago. <laughs> what do you mean? It's, it's a I don't think that was the plan 12 years ago, was it? It was for... I didn't know. It was I, for us. I didn't really even know. I this didn't make it for myself. He existed until recently. Yeah. <laughs> this, if anybody is watching, from the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers, who was around back then, I made this chest for them, for, a, uh, for the big group, and it took... That's how I know when it was made. I just dated back to then. And I actually have 
a curly maple one downstairs that's still unfinished so oh <laughs> the 12 year saga the is not actually over but i it's not as it wasn't as far along as this one so check that out is that so it's nice so huh? nice. tom brandon's asking if the overhang uh of the top in the back is to account for baseboards when it's against the wall who said that brandon brandon that's an excellent observation that's exactly what it's for so pug used to do that and uh so you see you got like this Add, an, add like a three-quarter in. I added a three-quarter for the shaker one, and you'll see that on the drawing. But if you have a larger baseboard, and you know that is in the room, and like a more traditional deep, thick one, then you might have to add a little more overhang. But that's exactly what it's for, Brandon, is to, so that when you slide the chest against the wall, it will be flat against the wall. It won't be held away by the bottom hitting. If you made that straight up, you'd have this gap and all your pencils and keys will go back there, right? All right, let's turn it around. You know, I was thinking about, I was adding up in my mind like how many chests I've made of all various types. And I came up with 32 different types and that's including high boys and chests on chests and you know, they're all various styles. The shaker dressers were some of the first full shaker chests that I, I've made in that form. So a lot of traditional 18th century like this. So it's about time that the camera lady gets a chest <laughs> drawers because we don't have a single one in our own home. That many chests and I never actually made one for our own selves. <laughs> and that goes back to the Thomas Moser price of a chest of drawers because <laughs> it's it's costly for time you know and if you're making a living doing this it's hard to just take that much time off to make yourself an elaborate chest now check this out i did this since last time we looked at this and maybe you didn't notice but one of the little details is when you close the drawer you want it to hit and not hit sharply and more of a thump um, so these are the drawer stops and the drawer front comes in and it bumps against there. That's explained in the article too and, and with the full size drawings you'll see. The reason the stops are right up here on the drawer dividers is because the sides are solid so they're expanding and contracting. If you put the stop in the back, the, as the piece expanded and contracted seasonally, the drawers would be gumming out and going setting back. So you need to put the stop right up here as a reference immediately behind the drawer front and that'll never change. All your drawers will be just right all the time. So if your grain on the side is running perpendicular, like maybe you have a frame and panel side or even if you had a plywood side for some reason, then you could put your stops at the back. So. I added, since you last here, I added this leather. Can you see that? Oh, no. Let's see. You're busy typing away. What's that? You are typing away. I wasn't. You've got to pay attention to so many things. So check this out. We've got this little piece of like 16th inch, almost 16th, leather. I glued it to the front of the stops. That leather provides just a softening, deadening, of the sound instead of like a hard crack sound of wood on wood the leather creates more of a, a thump so Thud. to do that i had to i had the drawer front space just right so i had to skin a little bit away from the back of the drawer front so it would sit back where it was nice but that's also included in the article and the uh full-size drawings of the shaker one if you want to do Would that. Would the shakers well. have done a raised panel back? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, most, no, most of the ones I s have seen are more traditional and they didn't, most, most period furniture spent very little time on the backs and even interiors. It's amazing how a gorgeous formal piece could be kind of crude looking in the back. They have wide boards, and it was more shiplapped, mostly shiplapped. The ones I looked at over at the Shaker Village, 
I didn't see any frame and panel. Mike, Mike says, if you were a shaker, you would have finished this 12 years ago. <laughs> 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 That's true. <laughs> right. Uh, All right, so come over here and check this out. Okay. Let's look at the top for a second, and then we'll finish up the drawers. Look at that beautiful match. Can you see it? Are you seeing the full color? It's really pretty. Oh, there. good. Yeah. So these are another couple boards. These are not book matched or anything like that, but really nice seam. There's one seam here, and these are those Pugmore boards. Now, I'm running my hand across. I, I've got two coats of tungaro varnish on here, and it feels a little grainy because it needs to be rubbed out. So someone asked earlier, do you do the same thing? You can. You can certainly level it, but this has a satin sheen to it, and I kind of like the sheen right now. And if you, if you can get away with it, this is laid out really nice. I see no brush marks or anything. It's just a beautiful laid out finish. So I'm just going to take some very fine wet dry paper. This is 1500 grit. And I'll, I'll go over this. This won't leave scratch marks, but it'll take off that, those very fine dust nibs. And, and it, let's see the camera lady here. Put your hand right here. Yeah, I was feeling it. If you, no, over this side right here. I already did some back there. Can you feel how grainy that is? Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me do this. All right, feel it again. It's like romper room. Romper room? <laughs> Did they do that? I don't know. I know. It just came to my mind. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why. Flashback. <laughs> it's a children's show. I totally uh, dated myself, didn't I? I don't know. You'd have to be from around here to know Romper Room, I think. You've never made a Bombay chef, have you? I haven't. I would love to. But I haven't had any call for one. But then maybe uh, that's a good one we can do down the road. But that's a pretty complex you know Thomas is asking are the side runners installed with dovetails too or just the faces no the side runners are tenoned into the front and back and they are held beautifully aligned by just the tenons and they're screwed to the side so they're really held in line there's no need really to dovetail all the way across there um, I like to make the chest so they're repairable down the road and that could be removed if needed. You show that on the video, I think. Yeah, that'll be part of, that's part of the Shaker series. When you see that, uh, you'll see him do that. The five so, working series. Yeah. So just by doing that, I've got a beautiful finish here. And I still have, like, the satin sheen. Now, I could rub it out all the way, but I kind of like that. If you want to bring the sheen up a little bit, you can just burnish it with paper towels and that'll brighten it subtly okay so let's get the drawers in let me show you one of the last here's a drawer come on over to the bench there's not a lot of maintenance on this piece is there Tom besides dusting no it's very little maintenance um, and here's what we did in a previous episode I added these hardwood strips that was a shop night live I mm -hmm. think so that was a while ago. We added those hardwood strips. And that's one of the things I wanted to upgrade this chest before I finished it. So that's a hard maple edge. And I did the same thing on the shaker dresser. But we did it with white pine sides so they don't show up as much. I'll give you a sneak peek at the shaker drawer arrangement. White pine is really light and very stable. So this is the ultimate in drawer construction in my opinion because the pine is very stable it doesn't add much weight to the piece and then you scarf on this piece of of uh, hard maple and that's gonna wear beautifully and it's just such a it's a much nicer situation now that's from the shaker dresser project you're saying that yeah that's like drawer. an extra drawer that's not actually yeah. so it's fine to use poplar. Usually you're using what's regionally available. So they'd use whatever. In the south, we used yellow pine a lot for our drawer sides. Up here, we use poplar and white pine. This one's poplar. Poplar is beautiful and fine, but it doesn't match as nice with the hard maple strip. 
and it's a little heavier. It creates a heavier drawer. So my, my premium drawer option now is what I just showed you on the shaker. And that's the way we're going to show that done. Now, this is just right off the gun. I haven't done anything to this drawer yet. I just want to show you quickly how you get it ready. It's got a little graininess to it because I sprayed this with the full pound and a half cut in here. And just by hitting it with broken down 320, it powders up and it gets really slick very fast. And it makes a nice interior side. So it's like you've got a nice coat of finish on that. And it'll just feel really, really nicely done without being overdone, you know. And Have you ever used Baltic birch for your sides and interiors? Um, you mean the plywood, I'm assuming. Uh, yes, plywood, sorry. Uh, I did say that. For drawer slides and back. I'm sorry, I should be more specific. Um, let us see. Yeah, I did on some utility-type utility cabinets. I'm trying to think, did we do that in our kitchen cabinet? I did those out of solid, too. Um, but that's more of like, you typically don't see plywood on this category of fine furniture. If you're trying to, to recreate period furniture, um, the sides were, are going to be solid. But if you want something, you know, just built in or something you want to bang out quickly, sure, you can use plywood. It's fine. Um, so now that's all ready. That just needs to be dusted off. This in the front, the shellac, needs to be quickly cleaned up on this drawer front. And again, I'm going to just knock it down with the 320 paper. And I've got this bead, this cock beading around the side that makes it a little more challenging to rub it out. So it's like a stop. The, the shaker drawers that I did are going to be flush fit, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but what I like to do is go around and get the bead first. So I'm going to take this steel wool and push it into the corner here. And get the bead and right, right in this flat area because it's hard to hit with the block. So I go cross grain there. And I'm taking away, once again, I'm taking that shininess away. And then we'll go down this way. That's nice. I'm gonna really burnish this. You have an opinion about Japanese joinery, Tom? Awesome. <laughs> I haven't done a lot of Japanese joinery, um, but it's amazing, like, some of the lengths they go to make a, a joint that quite often doesn't even need glue. <laughs> it's just very sophisticated in layout and assembly. But it's kind of, the closest I've come to that kind of joinery is when I've made these type of feet. For this chest of drawers, I made these type of feet that were dovetailed on the interior, like a, a blind miter dovetail. So the dovetail is never seen. You assemble and glue it up, and no one ever knows you did that. You could have done a miter. <laughs> And just a spline in there and but you know that's the difference <laughs> but I I've made extra so that people could see what it was like but you know in the end you trust the maker that he really did that but you know if you can't take it apart and some a lot of Japanese joiners like that too I mean you see it and you're the the magic is actually concealed you know you don't really get full appreciation of the quality of the workmanship. How, how did you, do you do that uh, bead on the drawer front, Tom? Steve's asking. It's applied. Um, I'm going to go over that sometime, I would say this year we'll, we'll have that, 
it's some kind of demo, of course. Um, but it's a full application on the top and bottom. This is the bottom, actually. I mean the top. And then just the half application. So the drawer is all made and, and dovetailed and glued up. And then you have to saw into the front to relieve like about a full eighth of an inch plus. And then I put the top and bottom and then hand chop the miters and put that side piece in. Um, it's, it's pretty easy sounds, to sounds understand. Sounds a little unnerving. It is when you saw it into the front. It is. <laughs> it's, you got to really be focused. One of my worst mistakes was in the middle of the night, sawing in the wrong way. <laughs> that was. Uh, John's moments. asking, when, when staining a piece, do you prefer to glue then stain or stain then glue? I have issues with squeeze out. I think it is all cleaned up, but when I apply the stain, oh, it's there. <laughs> um, I, I'm gluing things up before I'm staining. So I, I always uh, use a rag and squeeze it out good and try to get not over glue and then use it's like a terry cloth rag works the best and you use it almost like a scouring pad but it's gentle in it and you can see the haziness of the glue. So I'm always looking to see the haze completely disappear. And then you know you're not going to see it later. Um, but occasionally you will see it later. And when that happens, I just get out a card scraper quickly, scrape that area, quickly sand, and then go on with whatever I was doing, staining or whatever. All right, so there we go. We've got this all rubbed out. And I've got to get a little uh, wax on the front of this one. Here we go. Ready? Yep. And the Goddard's again. Yeah. So check out how beautiful oh these fronts get. So sweet. That's a beautiful look, huh? Mm. This isn't from the same boards. These were from Pug, but not quite the crazy quality of the top and sides. But isn't that rich? Yes. That is premium. Now, we're going to set the, the uh, there's a couple things to do. Uh, let's put in the hardware. And notice these little recesses here. I like to, I think that that's 5 8 Forstner bit. And I, I go about an eighth inch deep. That's so that the nut that holds the uh, drawer pull on is flush with the back so clothes could never get caught on it. Let me just put this through. Let's just go look at the front here. And what I'm putting on here are these bale pulls. These are swan bale pulls and um, really classic Chippendale style. Not overly, not ostentatious or anything like that. This is a little calmer version of a chest of drawers. So I'm going to put these posts in. These are the escutcheons and these are the posts and then the swan bale pull itself. This is a heavy pull for this chest. You could have gone a little lighter but I had these and I like I like a good hearty swan pull. Now the backs of these posts you see right here. Now if I tighten in that nut I can use a deep socket here you can see the nut is flush, but I've got to cut that post back. So I used to take a hacksaw, but I <laughs> invariably, if you don't protect as well, you'll end up cutting a little into the back of your drawer. So what I do now is I use a, um, a snip, like a bolt cutter like for electric. So you just take one of these. See this? I got a better one than this, but let's do this and hopefully it works. Do you remember if this walnut was air dried, Tom? Yeah, that's that's uh, for sure. It was, and that makes I I think that makes the best colored walnut. Maybe that's why you're asking, because um, so what I'm going to do 
the stuff that's kiln dried and steamed, it just gets grayed out and kind of, I feel like it's, it's dead, like in the color. Um, so I much prefer air dried walnut if you can find it. I mean, you can get the color back by, but you're ending up adding it in. So I've got like a, a good quarter inch sticking out because I know that's how much I have to cut off. And then I'm just going to snip this. I should have put a nut on there first, but that's pretty clean. If you don't, if you see a little burr right in there, you can just file it. You can take this to a sharpening stone and make sure that the nut thread's on there. That's all you're trying to do here. This is so tiny, it's frustrating. I gotta get a better file. I'm gonna take it actually to the... We have a question of what age you started doing woodworking, Tom. That's an interesting question, huh? Oh, yeah. It actually, I was really into it, then I got away from it, and then I got back into it full-time professional. But I started actually when I was like training when I was 13 and um, did two years in like a like a vocational school where I was doing this kind of work and then and then I got out of it I went to the college route so I could use big words to explain this <laughs> all right so I cleaned that up and threaded it on and there we go that's working nicely and that should be so let's just put it on I'll show you with both with and without and this is one of the little details that makes a difference so we've got the leather what are you doing there, we've babe? got the raised panel I'm putting the posts on I'm reassembling with the escutcheons and I'm gonna put it in the front if you're curious about Tom's story you can see it on our website there's a page called uh, bio epicwoodworking.com slash bio, I believe, or maybe it's slash about. But anyway, there, there's both those pages will give you a full layout right. of the timeline of Tom. He actually didn't go into this professionally until 30, age 30. Right, totally, yeah, because I went to, I was a math That's major. encouraging to some. Yeah, and then um, I was always messing around with it. And then I actually went to seminary. And um, then I decided to be a minister of wood. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. So check this out. Look at this difference. This one is still sticking out where you need to deal with it. But that's now flush. So when you look inside, you, I can run my hand over here and it's not sticking out. And it feels great. You can even file it a little if, you, if it's up a little bit. Um, but that's one of the details. You don't want clothes catching and hooking on there. You know, it takes a little longer, but it's worth it. You know, some people say the devil is in the detail, but I like to think the love is in the details because you're spending extra time. It's, it's the quick carelessness that you look at and you feel a little sense of disappointment when you discover it on furniture or something you bought. And you see some cheap, some corner cut inside the piece. It's like, ugh, I got kind of ripped off. Or this wasn't really made well. And what you're saying is it wasn't made with care. And you could step that up and say, it's not made with love. So really, the devil's not in the details. The love's in the details. <laughs> so when you're doing that, don't think of what you're putting into it. You're really pressing something special into this piece. And when people look inside a piece like that, they make the opposite kind of discoveries. They don't see something that was chintzy or cheaply done and hurriedly done, but they make discoveries of greater care and, and really concern and love for the making of it and the person who one day will possess it. So there you go. That's my little spiel for tonight. Um, but I'm going to just put this in since we're running a little, we're about done. This cut was made on the table saw with the blade 
up about a half of an inch and just held vertically on my crosscut sled. And I made a pass and then slightly slid it over to make a little wider than an eighth of an inch to accommodate the screw. So here's the screw that I'm going to use for this. And I'm going to knock this. That's a little rough still. And are then the I'll. Pan, are the drawer uh, bottoms raised? Are they what? The drawer bottoms raised panels? Yeah, so here I'll show you a closer look at it. So, yeah, this is a traditional way the drawer bottoms were done. Um, they, they are raised panel on the bottom, so it'll be flat in here, but you can see, can you see it from that profile? You can see how it tapers mm. to go into my 3 16 groove along the end. So okay. this is the way it works. If you look at the back of the drawer here, you put the flat side up with the raised at the bottom, and that has the scalloping from the hand plane. And this fits right in this groove and slides in from the back. And it goes right into the groove in the front of the drawer. Now, I have in the past tacked that in place, and then you want it to be fixed in the front and then allowed to expand and contract out the back. That's why we put that little slot. Okay, so this is going to be attached with a screw right here. And I just take that, I just take an awl, and I'm going to sight down and come in about a quarter of an inch. So I'm right in the middle of this half inch material. And then I'll bring in the drill bit. And I'm going to set it right in that little impression and here we go there we go and now I can run this screw in I got to put a little you got to put a little beeswax on it in honor of Pug <laughs> he would always do this and it makes a tremendous difference in the way it threads in there let me get my drill So here it goes. And then that washer, you just want to lightly snug this. Okay? So now, see how that is? That slot is going to allow this to expand and contract. Now, rather than tacking it, what I've started doing is actually, like I'll take this apart again, and I'll put a little bit of hide glue right in the middle. And that'll be in the slot. So it'll hold it in the front there. The hide glue will hold it. And if I ever need to disassemble, I just put a little hot water right in there. It'll soften and loosen the hide glue, and you can slide it out. But just remember that. If somebody's repairing these chests in the future and it has my name on it, that's how you get it out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if this is some kind of time capsule, someone's watching this video, you want to put a little hot water on the hide glue, and it'll come right out. All right, so... All of these were waxed as well. They're nice and silky. So imagine they were all put together. All of these are nicely done. You're ready to slide in the drawers. And I usually do sign it. I will sign this right in here. Sign my name and the location and the date and to the camera lady. You don't well, have to even say. Make me cry. You can say with love, but it's already written all over this piece. It's true. <laughs> so here you go. Hear that thump? It's beautiful. Did you hear that? Listen. Okay. If I didn't put that leather on there, it would be a sharp sound. You gonna mind hearing that in the morning when I get up and rummage <laughs> through the drawers? <laughs> I'm gonna be still sleeping. cursing. Another thump. All right. I'm gonna keep going. I already put the hardware on the other ones. What was the material for the drawer bottoms, hon? The drawer bottoms is also poplar. Oh, that's what I wanted to show you. Look at, I planed those off. See how green that is? Mm. That's fresh poplar. I wanted to make them thinner, so I ran them across the joiner and then I replaned them. But compared to the back, it's much greener. But it'll brine out somewhat over time. So then it goes in the space. 
just if you could feel how these are sliding it's unbelievable that'll get fixed so that swings properly let's keep going this is always fun this is like the end cam's asking what dates you're gonna put on it <laughs> yeah. start or end date i'm gonna put yeah i'll put the end date that's a good question <laughs> That's sort of like the old Johnny Cash song where he, he stole all the parts from the, to make a Cadillac from all different years. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and it was made up out of all different years, Cadillac. <laughs> Cadillac, ack, ack, ack. You need to move your cart? Sure. All right, last door. Wow, looks so nice. Thump. I mean, check that out. Is it worth the wait or what? Let's turn it to the side. <laughs> well, we'll never know. <laughs> I mean, that is strong. Yes, really Let me turn it around. Let me just do a circle. You can see that back again. <laughs> Look at like that. a man of white here. There's no, no corners cut here. Oh, what a beast. Okay. But I love this. This has that warmth, and it's got the connection to our days down in North Carolina. And the warmth of that Pugs shellac, I mean Pugs walnut, and all the classic signs. This is very much like a Pug Moore piece. He made a lot of 18th century. This is kind of a, this is a nice Chippendale style. They, they made more elaborate types, but this is a classic kind of Chippendale chest of drawers that you would see, you know, in a, it's not the highest form, but it's a, it's a nice style. Oh, I almost wow. don't want it in. Yeah, I think we can stop looking no. at it. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't because <laughs> that's one of the things we must do. And uh, you really need my neighbor Ed likes to tell me, you got to smell the coffee more, you know, if you're working really late. And that's, that's so true. But when you finish a project, you got to take time to kind of savor it and soak it in, celebrate the moment. <coughs> so let's just stand here and look at it for a while. <laughs> My father used to do that. And he would say, hey, what do you think? And we'd look at it. Does anyone else have that habit? <laughs> But then it's like, all right, that's enough. I'm actually, you know what? We're going to look at this a lot. This will actually be in our bedroom. And you'll get that, that satisfying feeling over and over again, seeing this off there, you know, because of the story that it encapsulates. Yeah. And then the beauty and use of it over the years. So there you go. It is a beauty. Camera lady. Thank you, hon. You're welcome. Um, Michael is asking, was that an applied molding on top or routed in the solid top? You spoke about that at the very beginning, didn't you? Which molding? This one? The is cold? That an applied the molding on top or routed in the solid top? I think I'm assuming it's the, on the top. Uh, this is routed on the solid. You can see the grain. Yeah, that's just, that's not applied, no. This was solid and that is routed. So if you looked close, you could see the grain continues right on out. This is end grain out here. So yeah, that, that is not applied. That's the way they did a lot of them as well. You'd usually see this would be applied to the case, but the molding on the top was integral to the actual solid wood top. And it, it looks sweet. You never have to worry about it. Break it off. No, we don't have videos of this piece being built, right? No, the, guild? the, the guild? guild might have <laughs> that series, but that's back in, well, they gave me this. Let me see what the dates are. As a thank you, this was from 2009 to 2012. So, yeah. It might not be quite 12 years. It might be 11. You don't, you don't journal your projects, do you? Journal, meaning? Write down and document your projects. I 
well, I am now by making videos and full-size drawings. <laughs> That's the way I'm doing it and art, writing articles. But when I make them, I have files where I have usually a scale drawing in there. And, and I know the process. Like sometimes I write out what I'm doing. But in order to pass on the process, I have to make, uh, I feel the best way is to make videos. Yeah. Because you actually get as close as you can to being with somebody and that's what I treasured so much being in Pugmore's shop was that he was right there. And it, there was like, I never had any mystery of, oh, what steps do I have to do now or skip? Because his notebook was very spare. He just had certain dimensions. But, you know, what are these dividers and what's the width and all that? Um, but all that, once you build a few, it starts to be more... Uh, you, you start to know the general dimensions and weights, visual weights of things that are appropriate for particular styles. Uh, so. Mark's observing that the top poles aren't perfectly aligned with the wide drawers. It looks right. How did you figure that out? The what? The, the, what? Tarp, the, the top poles aren't perfectly aligned with the wide drawers. It looks right, he says. How did you figure that oh, out? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Like... You have to decide sometimes when you have two over three like this. These are obviously centered. These are centered. And then you decide where to put these, how far over, or how far in you want these. A lot of times what we would end up doing on one that's proportioned like this is this post is actually the center of this here. Okay, so that's how this one worked out. And the spacing feels good when it's like that. I went through a lot of... Um, of a visual checking myself and deciding when I did the shaker chest because you have round knobs in that case. So you have the one round knob in the center of the top drawers and then you had to decide how far in to go with the round knob here. And so that was carefully thought out, believe me. When you see that article and that, if those of you who have already bought the full-size drawings, you know I think it's six and a quarter inches or something over to the inside. One other thing to note before we wrap up, is with these bale pulls, the weight of them, or the visual center of gravity of them, is actually below the post a little bit. It's more here. So you have the bale pull, how it hangs down that much. So the post, if you look at the center of the drawer right here, so the distance right here to here, the post is actually higher than the center line, by usually a quarter to five sixteenths of an inch we would go up with the post. So see how this post is not in the center of this width here. So they're always all justified up a little bit. So if I hold it up like that, maybe you can see it better. It's not centered here, but it visually looks centered once you swing the bale down and they look more appropriate. So when you're hanging those, you never want to go right in the middle or they'll look too low on the drawer front. All right, that's a left nuance for that. But I am going to do, at some point, a chest of drawers of this style. Um, but we decided to start with a shaker style because it's simpler. You know, there's less complications. And then what I really would love to share with you sometime is a bow front chest of drawers. It adds so much to put a pleasing shape to the front. You know, like the Bombay is over the top with the double curve. But the bow front is a fairly, it's not simple, but it's an extremely effective way to create a beautiful visual effect without, and the rest of it is just basically a chest of drawers. So we will be doing something like that. Yeah. Probably so. not this year, but coming. If you hang around long enough, we're going to go through everything <laughs> I've ever done. Actually, I don't think we could do that in my lifetime, but... Are the three lower drawers graduated widths larger at the bottom? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. This chest is, that's very typical of period pieces, that the drawers would be wider at the bottom. And usually they're approximately an inch narrower as you come up. So this one's probably, this is I think five and a half, and then six and a half, and then... Um, no, actually, that's five and a quarter. That's six and a quarter strong. 
and that's a little bigger than, so that's seven and three eighths. So they're usually an inch to an inch and an eighth as you go. And that's, I love that look. Like when you have them all the same, it's not, I mean, it's faster because you can run everything, but these are all custom placed. And these, if you notice the top two drawers, the grain is sawn from one board, so it appears that the grain flows right across. And I set it up so the grain happened to curve down here, and it curved on this side down, and that was intentional to create almost like a symmetry, a beautiful arc in that grain. If these drawers got reversed, it wouldn't look right, and you wouldn't have the appearance of a continuum across. And one thing I always do to make sure, because these are a little different width, is I put a Roman numeral in here, the Roman numeral 1, and that one has a 2, and then you see the 1 here. And then the others can't be confused. So the tops get signified that way. All right. Well, that was a fun night, huh? We actually got something done. <laughs> and uh, a very satisfying piece to finish up. So thanks again for hanging out with me and joining me here. If you enjoy this content, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell and you'll get notified every time. And if you want to get closer to us and hang out more, go to our website at epicwoodworking.com and get on the mailing list there. Thank you all so much for hanging out with me tonight, for spending some time with me in the shop. I look forward to seeing you next time, right back here on Shop Night Live! <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. It's a great night. I'll leave you with a final view here. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. <laughs>